Good morning. Excited about some Kotlin? Yes. Right. I'm so honored to speak here about Kotlin right after Venkat, actually, who is sitting on the back there. Hello, Venkat. And knowing especially that he writes a book about Kotlin, I'm reading it. Honestly. <laughs> OK. So if for some weird reason you're not following me on Twitter, there is your chance. Uh, my name is Anton. I work for JetBrains. You can probably tell by T-shirt. And I usually speak about TeamCity uh, to our users and help them to use it properly. Sometimes I speak about Kotlin, like today. Sometimes I speak about IntelliJ and so on. And uh, yeah, let's talk about Kotlin today. So we are talking not just about Kotlin, but we are uh, talking about DSLs in Kotlin, right? And how many of you actually know what the DSL means? The main specific language. Have you implemented yourself? Never, right? Who implements DSLs anyway? But this is not something new. It's like there's many, many, many talks about DSLs anyway. And this is like yet another DSL talk. And usually when I speak to, to people about DSLs, uh, it feels strange to them because why do I speak some old topic? Uh, and usually they don't have really a good experience. If, if they had implemented one, they don't really have a good experience. And if they had to use some DSL that someone else implemented, the experience is even worse. Because normally, uh, only the authors of the DSLs know how to use them. There is no proper tooling. There's a special format that you have to use. So it's complicated. But I think the, the, the experience comes from, the bad experience comes from the implementations because normally those DSL languages were implemented in a dynamically type language or some textual format and didn't have tooling support and so on. So I think Kotlin fixes some of that, a lot of that. And, and uh, in case of Kotlin, it actually it is not fair to say that Kotlin lets you write a DSL, because this is just a syntactic sugar, some special idioms in Kotlin programming language. So when you start programming in an idiomatic way, it kind of becomes, the program becomes a DSL, especially if you add a special vocabulary to the mix. And you will see that, hey, the, the program already looks like a DSL. And this is what we are going to take a look at today. So for example, I will show you a few examples. And I want you just to follow them. There are many of them. And uh, we'll, I, I want you to see uh, what are the similarities between them. So the first one is like a small library to generate HTML files, right? It's uh, pure Kotlin code, statically typed, statically checked, compile time checked. Everything works in the IDE, auto completion, everything. But it looks like a structure, right? Like HTML, but without those uh, triangle braces, or whatever you call them. The next one is an Anki library, which is also by, Jet, by JetBrains, but for Android developers. And uh, well, looking at the code, you actually immediately see that there's a text field, there is another text field, there is a button. So it's very easy to see what's going on there. Another one is Kotlin DSL so if, uh, for, for, for uh, Gradle. So if you are using Gradle now, you can use Kotlin to actually write those scripts. Uh, also, the benefit of using Kotlin in Gradle is that it's statically checked, right? But it feels almost like those uh, old, uh, old groovy scripts that you had to write uh, the syntax-wise. Another one is a library for accessing the databases, right? So it's a little bit more like uh, programming imperative style, but still you have like you can see and read it like okay, there is a table definition. There's we start a transaction, we create a table, we insert some values into the database, and then we make a select, make a query to the database and iterate over the results. But it's still 
reels, uh, reads fluently and there's still a structure to it. Right? Another one, just a hobby project of a friend of mine who was working with Vadin framework and he wanted to uh, nicely define the layout inside, in inside his code. So there you see like a vertical layout, so you see some elements inside, you see buttons and so on. So it's immediately readable as well. Kotlin DSL for Kubernetes. So instead of writing unchecked or statically non-checked uh, YAML files in a textual form, you can write Kotlin code, which, well, it will be a little bit more verbose compared to YAML probably, but still it will be checked compile time, which is a great benefit. Another one is uh, Kotlin DSL for TeamCity, the product that I'm working on. Um, there is also a possibility to define build scripts for TeamCity in Kotlin. So like configuration as code, right? And another one, Ktor, which was released this week, uh, the web framework. So there you see like some Ktor specific code that kind of uh, instantiates the server jetty in here. And then actually what is interesting is that inside the code where we define the routing, in the response we can see the very first example that we have on, in our list, the HTML library, right? So we, are, we can see that uh, two different DSLs are interleaving in, one, in the same code. And that's thanks to the fact that both those DSLs are actually the idematic Kotlin code. There is nothing special about There is no grammar, that special grammar that the parser has to uh, parse and handle. It's just Kotlin code, and it's just the different vocabulary that we use for those different DSLs, and therefore we can intermix them. Okay, did you watch carefully? What is the similar about all those examples? Come on, speak to me. Don't be shy. It's so simple. They all look similar because it's Kotlin. Sorry? OK. It's the same language. You can see like, it, it's hard to make a different DSL right in the same language. All right, but um, what I wanted you to actually notice in the, all those DSLs is, that the fact, is the fact that how they look like, how the structure looks like. So we normally start with some verb, open a block. Then we add another block inside that block. Then we have some kind of attribute that we assign a value to. Then there might be another attribute that we assign a block to. Right? So we, we can see that it nests all the time. So it's like a nesting structure. And uh, since it's a programming language, some of the syntactic sugar that it has we can apply in that DSL as well, like some enforcing some of the values. Like in Kotlin, we have named arguments. So it's possible to use this named, named argument to kind of add something to our DSL. And since it's a Kotlin code, we can also invoke functions, create objects, and so on, so because we are creating a structure. And since it's all like valid Kotlin code, it can be checked by the compiler, it works in the ID, it can be syntax colored, uh, autocompleted, and so on, refactored. And when you see it all working in the ID, it feels like magic. Wow. Nice. So let's, let's write some code and see how we can create a simple DSL ourselves. What are the syntactic uh, sugar elements that we can apply and, and how we can actually create something for ourselves to, re to reuse. So the example that I have here is by my colleague. It's not mine. So I have a link to his repository uh, at GitHub. But I think it just explains very nicely how to actually create this kind of things. So this is like the normal Java code, idiomatic Java code, right? There is nothing wrong with it. It's a good code. Everybody can read it, understand it, and understand what it does. The only problem that we might say it has is that you actually have to read through every line and understand what it's doing. So it actually requires some mental effort to go through the code, right? So let's 
let's do a little transformation here. So we take the code, we go into the Kotlin file in the ID, and we paste it here. So it's and the ID actually will tell us that, hey, I just pasted some Java snippet in there, and you're pasting it into the Kotlin file, so let me transform it for you a little bit. So let's say yes, make some imports. The code didn't change much, changed a little bit. So the first one, the first change that you will notice is that there is no type on the left. So instead of writing out the type, we have a val keyword. Next, another one is that we don't have to type the new keyword, right? So we just type the constructor. And, and basically, that's it after the first transformation. Uh, <clears throat> now, let's, let's execute the code and see how it runs. So it's, it's the initial state. We didn't change anything yet. Compiling. So it printed out something. It printed out a string with the reference to the class. OK. Let's see what is the code that we are working on. So there is like a few classes, a few Java classes. There's like a client, like with getters and setters, a few builders, company, company builder, and so on. Right? So there's nothing special. But we are going to make one constraint here, is that we cannot change the Java code. So imagine that those Java classes that I have right now in the project, they came from the library. They are packaged in some jar file, and I have no control over them. Right? So I'm using those Java classes as a library. So I cannot change them. So the only thing I'm going to change right now is this Kotlin code that I'm writing. OK. So the, the, remember the result. When we executed the code, there was like a string with a reference. And uh, there is no proper kind of value or string printed out when we print this client here. This is because the client class does not implement the toString method. And how would you solve this problem normally in Java? You would write some kind of a client util class with a static method passing the client uh, reference as a parameter and print out those values, right? In Kotlin, we have uh, extension functions, which is basically the same way, but an idiomatic way to implement utility functions, and we are going to write one. So instead of writing client in here, we are going to write it like this, some to console string, for instance. You don't have this uh, method yet, but we are going to add one. Client to console string. Why is that? OK. So to console string, and it's going to return a string. We are going to write in a Java idiomatic way right now. So we are writing this with curly braces. And what we need to return is some kind of a string as well, right? So return clients. Oh, this. Uh, let it be some Twitter handle and the company, company name, let's say. All right. So since it's Kotlin, we can simplify it a little bit. First of all, when we are adding the static uh, extension method, we are already in the context of the client code itself, so we don't have to write out this reference here. So it will be inside client anyway. We have the access to Twitter field and company field. And now, since it's, it's a one-liner, we don't really have to type out those curly braces, we can just and return string so we can simplify the code a little bit. So let's see how it executes now. So we are going to transform in, uh, like in very little steps and see how the code changes. This is not related to DSL transformation yet, but we, we, we can see that this is like a small element of Kotlin uh, features. 
that will actually help us later. OK, so we have extension method. It, it's nice, but we can even simplify it a little bit more. First of all, uh, in Kotlin, we have string interpolation as templates. Convert to the template and have it like this, right, as a one-liner. And the other thing that really is not that nice is that I have to call a method here. Would it, wouldn't it be nicer to have something like this without extra braces? So it looks like a property access, and Kotlin actually has properties, and it has extension properties, so we can actually as we add it, like as we had the extension method, like we added a new method to existing class, we can actually add properties the same way. So while client to uh, no console string uh, string gets equals and the same string. Here it is. Also nice. So we kind of simplified our main code a little bit as well. And now it's a matter of taste if I use templates in here or the old way through the concatenation. Basically the same thing. I think it's just a matter of taste. OK, that was like a small intro. So we already see two nice features in Kotlin. It's like extension methods and extension properties. Those will actually help us later on. But we will keep it like this. Now, remember. What was the like similar about the, all those examples that I, I showed you? There was a structure, and every structure started with some of like some first invocation, first method, something like create server, create document, create something. So let's let's have the same for our client here. So we are going to have a method that is called create client as an entry point and create client. And in our code, the client is built using the client builder. So we need somehow apply this client builder when we are creating the client inside this method here. So, uh, and, and this code should be like nesting, as we remember. So what, what we can do here is to pass in actually a consumer interface that uses the client builder to assemble our client instance. So what, what, client, uh, what, what, what is the consumer? Do you know what the consumer is? It's the standard Java 8 interface that was added in Java 8, right? And if you go and see what it actually means, it's the operation that accents, accepts a single input as an argument and returns nothing as the result. So it accepts something, does something with it, initializes something there, and returns nothing. So basically, the result of this work is that it initializes something. So, and inside the code, we, we actually have to now instantiate the client builder. So, uh, val builder equals client builder. Since we are using this interface, there is like accept method that we are going to pass in the builder into. So inside that accept uh, uh, inside that accept method, we are going to do the real job to instantiate our client using the client builder, and then the result is going to be returned. Return re today. I'm typing really bad. Return builder build. OK. And we are going to create the client, obviously. So let's start from here. <clears throat> we are going to use that method create client. And now we actually need to pass in the implementation of that interface, right? That it's going to actually instantiate our client. So in Kotlin, or in Java, it's actually a Java-like way, but we are writing the code in Kotlin. We are going to uh, implement an anonymous class. 
anonymous implementation of that interface. Object consumer uh, client builder. And then we are going to implement the interface. And all the code we already have is written here. So that's, that's the operation insta inside um, the interface that we actually need to execute. So it's actually a client, and this is actually a builder. So did we make our code simpler right now? Actually not, because this is like, it's not an idiomatic way how to write Kotlin code. This is a Java way right now. We are implementing like anonymous class using the interface and so on. But the idea already tells us that, hey, you, you can actually simplify it. You probably don't see it on the screen, but it actually uh, underlined the first line that, hey, you can actually make it simpler. So I converted it to Lambda. And after converting it, it also says to me that, hey, you probably don't need this generic parameter anymore. We still implement the interface, but using the Lambda instead. And in Kotlin, of course, uh, if you have a Lambda with one argument, you don't really need to specify it. It's specified ex in, in, implicitly. So uh, we can either remove it or rename it to it. And uh, if it's it, it already is implicitly there, so we don't really have to specify it. And we see that we work, the it argument is already there. The, the idea is actually helping, helping, helping us with that. Uh, and the code is getting even more simpler. What is not nice here is that I have to type the consumer name here, right? We still are using this interface. Uh, how can we get rid of it? We actually have first uh, lambdas as first class citizens in Scotland, so why do we need an interface? Let's get rid of that by specifying a lambda in a signature instead of an interface. So we are going to specify a lambda that accepts an argument and returns nothing. And since it's a lambda right now, not an interface anymore, we don't really have to call the accept method. We can call the lambda directly. So this is like a small transformation. And now after we did it, idea uh, highlights the code again and tells us, what does it tell us? It tells us that we can move out the lambda out of the um, braces. So, we can just remove the braces and have a lambda as a block. Because in, in Kotlin, if you have uh, a lambda as a last parameter in the arguments list, you can move it out of the braces and have it just after the method call. And you can already see that we have the first block there, the first block of like nesting. So it's like the first level of nesting that we want. So we have create method, and we have a block of code here. The, 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 the fact that I have to type out it every time actually disturbs me right now. And uh, I would like to execute this code, this block should be executing inside the context of the client builder. Now we have to refer to the client builder through the it parameter. But I want this code to execute inside the client builder instead. So what I can do is actually make a magic trick here and define our lambda, our parameter, not just a, a lambda with an argument if, with no, val, uh, with no um, result, but instead I can say that this lambda should be an extension to my client builder class. And now you can see client builder is now referring to this, so this instead of it, right? So it means that instead of referring to client builder instance, I'm already executing inside that context, so I don't have to refer to it. And now I can actually remove all those it uh, 
elements, and the code is already compiling. So we have access to the first name inside the client builder right inside that block. So whatever is inside that block is executing in the context of the client builder, thanks to the fact that we specify the parameter as an extension lambda, or the official name is lambda with the receiver for the client builder. So receiver is the client builder. OK, so it's getting simpler. And now we can apply the same trick to the, the following structures that we have in the code, to the Twitter builder and to the company builder. So instead of um, writing the three lines for client, uh, Twitter builder, I would probably like to write something like this. Let's see. Twitter, Twitter, a block, and then have something like this in here. It doesn't compile right now, but we are going to make it to compile. So what, what, what is my next step here? Twitter block does not exist. So you, if, if there is a block, you can definitely say that it's a method call, right? We don't have a method yet. But where this method should be defined? So we are executing inside the context of the client builder. So it means that we need a new method called Twitter in the client builder. And we already know how to do that. Fun, client builder. Twitter. That's the extension method, right? And we already know the trick that whatever inside the block should be executing in the context of some builder. In our context, it will be the Twitter builder. And to do that, we need to specify the signature like this. So we, we are going to have a parameter that is a lambda with the receiver for the Twitter builder, right? Good. So inside that block, what we need to do, we basically need to do the same trick as here, right? We need to instantiate the Twitter builder, apply the block, and return the result or assign the result somehow. Since we are executing inside the client builder context already, we have the access to Twitter field that it has. So we can actually just use the assignment operation, Twitter builder, and apply the block and build our, you know, the, the part that we want to. So what it does here is instantiates the Twitter builder, so it instantiates the class that we need. And then it executes the block right after the constructor. Think about it this way. So we just created a class, or created the instance of the class, execute the block in there that actually will be written as a client code, and we build the client. So you can see it already compiles. right? So this block, which goes to the apply method, and actually executes. Right, so assignment operation will be do done inside the applying method. OK, and we can do the same for the company. Why not? Let's have the same code. Company, it will be the company builder. Company builder, no, not compiler builder, but company builder. Company. And the same for this one, company. And obviously, we assign it to the company field. So basically, the same mechanics here. We pass in the block. The block executes within the context of the company builder. And we assign it to the field of client builder, right? <clears throat> so now we can actually transform this code that we have into something like this. And we don't need to, we don't need the company builder anymore, and we can remove those two fields because we have the direct access within the block to the company builder fields. Good. 
So we started with some really simple Java code, which wasn't that bad, I would say. But um, let's see how it looked before. So if you compare two, two of those examples, it's not fair to compare those directly. But the one on the right, you have to actually parse with your eyes and have some, some mental effort to actually understand what it does. A few more seconds, probably a couple more seconds than uh, the code on the left. It's much simpler. For this small example, the, the, the effect is probably not that big. But when you have a lot of code, it's much easier when you have nesting within your code to actually understand it. So you look at it to the eyes, and your eyes immediately catch the structure. So it's much more readable. And it's still statically typed, compiled, type, time checked, everything. Really nice. So, but one, one little issue is here. Com uh, those two methods, right? So imagine if I made a, a little mistake. Imagine if I defined this company, uh, company method within the scope of Twitter. The code still compiles. And in, in our case here, it will still be correct even. It will be correctly instantiating the structure. But what if the Twitter builder defined its own uh, company method, for instance? Then there would be like a name clash. And the result that we would get would be a very strange one, like probably not what we expect. Probably the author of the. Uh, data model that we are using, the Java classes, did not expect you to use it this way, or the um, DSL creator who created this DSL for you. So probably his intent is to use company outside the Twitter block, and you are defining it inside the Twitter block. So we need some kind of a scope control for those structures, so that you shouldn't be able to define something inside like a block that is not designed for that. So how do we do that? In Kotlin, there is like a small annotation that you can use to control scope uh, for, for those kind of invocations. And uh, before we introduce those annotations, I will actually remove this code from here and uh, move it into the separate class. Instead of typing, I will just comment out the code and uh, remove the same code from here. So imagine that I'm extracting the code that I have written into a library. Why is that? Because if you write the DSL for yourself just to, to be used once, it's, there is no point. If you just introduced more complexity to your code without actually being able to reuse it, then there is no point. You just, you know, you'll have long conversations with your colleagues, probably, and, and uh, will have no benefit of using the DSL. But if, you're, if you have, like, a, an opportunity to extract it and reuse it in different parts of the projects, this is where you start getting the benefit of it. So imagine we are just moving out our code into a library uh, in a separate file. So we, it's, it's the same code as we have written, same extension methods, uh, same console string, and so on. Oops, sorry. And now I was talking about annotations, right? So in Kotlin, there is a DSL marker annotation that you can use. You, can, you cannot use it directly. You have to create your own annotation and then use the DSL marker annotation on that and then you will use your own annotation instead. So here I will define my own annotation, client DSL, and mark it with the DSL marker. And then I can use this annotation to mark my uh, classes that take part in the DSL structure. Right? The, the, the problem with my case here is that I cannot annotate the Java classes, because they are in the library. We have this. Uh, constraint here is that, that we cannot change Java code. But we can actually derive from those Java classes and annotate the, those instead. So this is what I do. 
I derive from company builder, from Twitter builder, from client builder, create new classes for my Kotlin DSL, annotate them with my new annotation, the, the marker annotation that will be used to check the scope of my DSL. And now if I go back to my client definition here and move the client, uh, the company block inside Twitter, the compiler will tell me, hey, this is like a wrong use of the DSL. You cannot invoke company in scope of Twitter. And it will kind of add more validation. It will add more security to my DSL for my users, right? So that my users will be able to use my DSL and not blame me for that. Nice, isn't it? So, any questions, by the way? Yes? Okay, the question is, can I debug it? The answer is, yes, you can. The same way, it's the same imperative code. It's normal Kotlin, it's, I have not created any extra grammar. I have created a thin layer of sugar on top of the existing Java classes so that I can idiomatically consume them from my Kotlin code, right? So this is a method invocation. The Twitter, right, I stopped the method. So let, let's, let's, do like, let's do it backwards right now. So what we did here is that we created this create client that takes a lambda. And probably when you see it for the first time, you don't really understand what is going on. But if you just add The brace isn't here, right? Means that it's a method invocation. We invoke the create client method, and the parameter for this method is this block, right? It's the same for this Twitter block. We add braces. It's the method invocation where we have a block that actually defines a lambda that can be um, cast, let's say it's casting for the Twitter Builder DSL. Same for the company, right? Idea already tells us, hey, you are using it in not in really the idiomatic way because Lambda can be written as a last parameter uh, for the invocation outside of the uh, braces so we can just, you know, move the Lambda out of the braces. So it already tells you, hey, you have just blocks, and you're passing in the blocks the same way as you do in Java, but with anonymous inner classes, right? When you implement the method like function interface, consumer interface that we had in the beginning, and so on. But it really is clean. There is no, not, not that much noise left after we all re removed it, and, and we just have to understand that whenever we have some kind of a verb or a term inside the block, and after that we immediately see like a lambda, it means that it's a parameter to the method call, and definitely that method will use lambda with the receiver as a parameter. Right? Let me show you the real life example, actually. We have a DSL in in Team City, where you define your builds. So, for instance, we have a build configuration for the application. We give it a name. We say that it produces some jars. Uh, we uh, monitor some some Git repository, you know, at some URL. And then there are some build steps that we define. For instance, it's a Maven project. We we have a Maven build step with clean package. You know, it produces the artifact that we want. And then it depends on some library, on some other build, right? So we, we define the dependencies right here so that it dependent on the other build configuration that produces the library jar. And we define that we need this library.jar to do something, right? 
And here you also see a lot of blocks, a lot of nesting blocks. So if I, if I go to the definitions of, the, of those blocks, I will see that there is a lambda with the receiver, right? I can see that steps is a lambda with the receiver. I can see that maven is a lambda, like there is a lambda with, re with the receiver, again. Like every time, like there is a type dot, then a parameter list, and, and the result, resulting type for that lambda. Sorry again? Yes, there, like if I if I go to the definition of dependencies, there will be some the library, the ID, right, and the lambda with the receiver. So a good practice is if inside that block there are some attributes that are um, required, absolutely required. You cannot leave them as null. Then it's a good good practice to put them as parameters right in here, because then you cannot skip them. You have to define them, like in this method call, right? I, I, I actually have to like, specify a parameter. And then inside the block, I can do everything else. I can do some programming, basically. Uh, sometimes people ask, why, why wouldn't we restrict uh, everything? inside that block besides calling the methods of, of the receiver itself, right? But then you will lose, lose the flexibility. Sometimes you need to be able to call some kind of a method for initialization that is somewhere else, defined somewhere else. Um, and therefore, we just have the scope control that you cannot interleave different blocks that are from the same receiver, or from different receivers. Okay. Good. So this is like a, a end of the demo. I will have my slides uh, in the internet. But now, if you did not remember a thing, and it was too complicated, just remember one thing. There's one essential part of building D DSLs in Kotlin is the lambda with the receiver. And that's the basic syntax of it, right? We have a type, and we are adding an extension method, which is a lambda, to that existing type. And, and then we can actually uh, easily create those nesting structures within our code that look natively like a DSL, but it actually is a normal statically type, uh, typed Kotlin code. OK. So if you want to learn more Kotlin, I can suggest a few books. Uh, the first two books, The Kotlin in Action and Atomic Kotlin, are by the colleagues of mine. And uh, Programming Kotlin is currently in baking um, by Venkat. And, and there are courses on Kotlin right now on Coursera and Stepic. And then you can actually uh, apply to those courses and use IntelliJ plugin to integrate with them and do all the assignments. And, and uh, it's really fun. So if you have any questions, I probably have a few minutes uh, to answer. And I hope it was fun. Was it? Was it useful for you guys? It's plugin for IntelliJ and not other IDs. For you, you mean for the Kotlin Co plugin? Yeah. Or mm -hmm, a Kotlin plugin. It's for uh, IntelliJ support is like is the first class, of course. Uh, I know that there is uh, Eclipse plugin as well that the team is working on. It probably lags behind a little bit. Uh, and there is some kind of a start of NetBeans plugin as well, as far as I know. Thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? Are there any Kotlin programmers in the room? No? Well, I hope it was something new and you learned something. But well, just remember this guy, right? Nothing, nothing else. Everything else you can, you know, read from the documentation and and learn yourselves as well. Okay, thank you very much, and I think I can stop it right here and you go for a coffee. <laughs>